Welcome back to If I Knew You Better. I'm Brendan Davis, your host, and this week's guest is Ken Lee. Ken is the vice president of Michael Weesey Productions. And if you've been listening to the show for a while, you have noticed that I've had a lot of their authors on this show. And I don't do sort of overly promo y shows. I like to get into the meat of what someone's about and their story. And it was really nice to get to talk to Ken about his particular journey into helping to co-helm with Michael Weesey, this amazing company that has put out so many of the now classic books about film and TV and media. And Ken is based in Seattle. I'm in Beijing, so we had to coordinate the time difference, which is, you know, wasn't too hard. But it was a really great conversation, and I especially enjoyed hearing how they built this. If you are interested in publishing specifically, or just small businesses in general that have become a bigger business, it's really cool to hear how they essentially, you know, sort of turned this, this one, one of one of many things that Michael himself was doing back in the day, they turned it into this company that now has this international presence. And I think it's a really great talk. It's kind of a long interview, but it's really enjoyable, I think. And we're going to get right into it. Please enjoy my talk with Ken Lee. Ken Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Brendan. I appreciate it. I'm really glad to have you here. We got acquainted for the first time very super briefly in person, probably about eight or nine years ago when Michael Weesey debuted his film about ayahuasca. We just said hi because we had some common friends and I got to go to the screening that was over at the Limley in Westwood. But I've known you by remote, sort of by name for years because I've seen your name in all of these books from Michael Weesey Productions. And so for the sake of learning more about you, we're going to have a big talk today that talks about a lot of things. But to get started, can you kind of tell us the short version of who you are and where you're from? And then we'll kind of just go from there. Well, sure. Uh, my name is Ken. I'm a Chinese American. I grew up in Los Angeles, um, spent uh, almost all my life there. And uh uh, earlier before, uh, during the the intro, you were asking how I first met Michael, and it's now it's become kind of like the, one of the mythological <laughs> stories of the of the uh, film education world. But uh, I guarantee you, it's completely true, and it's uh, memorialized in his um, his memoir called "Onward and Upward." Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter was, I was uh, working as an associate producer on an award show. Um, long time ago, and it went really, really well. That's always nice. That that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, a lot of hard work, uh, a lot of uh, interesting connections. Uh, at, at one point during that particular award ceremony, we honored Kurosawa, and uh, there was a rumor that someone would get to pick him up at the airport, and I oh, raised wow. my hands. Like, I want, I, I <laughs> and, uh, Unfortunately, while he still was uh, alive and in pretty good health, uh, he uh, demurred and, and uh. did not decide to come. But we did do a very good show reel for him, and the presentation was done by Richard Gere. Wow! And, uh, oh, I, I think I uh, saw press about this possibly way back in the day. Yeah, it was it was quite quite a while ago, but yeah. uh, the the event went well, and like like people do, and like I recommend young people to do after you uh, score a goal or do something <laughs> yeah. of note, you know, this is the time when the, the iron is hot. You start asking for recommendations. And so right. one of the other producers, I said, who can introduce me to someone in the business that I could meet? And uh, I'll never forget. Carol Lawrence said, there's this guy. <laughs> That's what she <laughs> described it. He lives in studio city. He's got a million projects. I don't even know how he does it. He's in uh, video projects. He's mm -hmm, a consultant. Mm -hmm. I think he publishes some books on the side. Seems really busy. He's a good guy. Call him. I said, sure. I'm like, what's his name? He says, Michael Weesey. I said, sure. So I got his number. I called him. And uh, sure enough, he picked up the phone and said, oh, you're a friend of Carol's. I'd be happy to meet you. But uh, let me make this 100% clear. I am not in a position to hire I'm not hiring, but let's have lunch. Mm -hmm. So we meet in the glorious studio city in July, and it's hot, of sure. course. And uh, 
I must have really had my, my game face on and my game plan because over the course of two or three hours, we talked about his goals and what he was doing and the transitions he was making in terms of um, his consulting projects. Mm -hmm. And I was like, make, I was kind of writing mental notes. I wasn't taking notes in front mm -hmm. of him. I thought that would be a little rude. Yeah. But I was taking a lot of mental notes of just counting his projects. Okay, PBS, got it. Oh, mm -hmm. he's got a, he's got a, you know, a couple of video projects involved. He goes, and he does these other interesting things with uh, his uh, his books that he's self-publishing. Mm -hmm. So essentially at the end of that long conversation, I said to him, Michael, how are you possibly going to be able to do this without some assistance? Is yeah. I'm the one who can help you. <laughs> he kind of looked at me, and I actually remember this to this day, and he goes, and he goes for the clothes. basically <laughs> saying that, He's recognizing what I'm doing, yeah. and I'm recognizing that he recognizes it. But uh, long story short, he, he hired me, and awesome. uh, we've been working together since. And sort of, uh, quite honestly, you know, learning chunks of the business and different pieces and uh, along the way. Mm -hmm. A lot of early consultation work, really, with some really interesting companies, mm -hmm. um, home video companies, and. Um, uh, uh, other marketing companies and, and so forth. And then the books uh, side of the business, the publishing side, and he'll be the first one to tell you that was, was almost an afterthought. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a case where uh, back in those days, some of the books that were uh, amazingly successful, uh, we used to get a call from a very um, early distributor who just used to call us and say, Sold out again. Print more books. So, oh, okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and uh, that was that was shot by shot. And um, wow. you know, I was I was privileged and lucky and fortunate enough to see some of the very first amazing um, manuscripts mm -hmm. that eventually mm -hmm. became long term bestsellers. The kind of yeah. books that you know that are on your shelf sure. to this day, uh, including uh, the Writer's Journey by Chris Vogler. Right. So, saw the very first manuscript. Wow. And Michael said, this looks interesting. And I said, yes, it does. <laughs> and I said, who, is, who is this guy? And, you know, he kind of described, well, you know, it, met him through a friend and he's has a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, story to tell about, uh, uh, about a hero with a thousand faces, but with a twist. And, uh, you know, uh, three editions later and, and a new 25th anniversary edition on its way. You know, it's, it's really nice to have that kind of long-term friendship, uh, mentorship, uh, with Michael and Chris, uh, that we've worked with each other, trusted each other, mm -hmm. worked really hard on all those editions. And, um, uh, it's quite a story. Same thing Absolutely. with Judith Weston. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, saw the very first manuscripts for directing actors, which is still a best-selling title after all these years. Yeah, it's absolutely. Kind of a, it's, kind of, it's kind of astonishing that uh, they had that kind of traction when there really was no category. We were kind of inventing the category along the way, and as I'm sure as Michael told you, it came a lot out of his own intellectual curiosity. It's like, right, These right. are smart people. I could learn a lot from them. If they convey this information in a book form, you know, then they'll be part of my my world and my uh, part of my uh, sphere of influence, and uh, and so on and so forth. And um, as the years kind of unfolded and people um, started approaching us about uh, the writer's journey, I'm not sure if Chris uh, conveyed that to you in his mm -hmm. interview. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. I know he did convey the part about the uh, him trying to shop at the New York publishers right, which I right. didn't know, which I didn't know oh, okay. I didn't know either <laughs> by the way but the part that uh, I always thought is so fascinating is that I remember getting the call from uh, a, a very uh, high end New York publisher with a very uh, uh, affected tone on the voice that basically said you you guys uh, we kind of know about you and, you know, you've, you've, you've done a fine job, you know, taking the writer's journey 
but we're going to take it to the next level. And huh. and so we started taking notes like, oh, really? What yeah. Would you well, what would you do, for instance? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would your playbook be? I mean, you know, hypothetically. <laughs> So well, it, 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 it was an honest conversation about, uh, you know, the trajectory of that particular book, which was already very successful. And uh, at the end of the conversation, we jumped on a conference call uh, with, with Chris mm-hmm. and said, you know, we, we got a pretty substantial offer from a major New York publisher uh, who wants to take the book to the next level. And uh, uh, we think we understand the dynamics of what it would do for the book and for you and for us, if we continue to take it on. Right. And, uh, I think the phrase that kind of came up over and over again, even at the early juncture in our relationship, uh, was, uh, you know, you're never going to be backlisted. You're always going to be a front list. You'll always be an important entity. Right. To us. It would be meaningful to you guys you know, building the company. Yeah. While other uh, publishers of any size, you know, as soon as the next Harry Potter comes around, <laughs> you, you, your phone yeah, calls are dropped. <laughs> totally. Totally. It's like <laughs> the when Rolodex, the Rolodex goes, goes away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like when, um, you know, I, from, from being a filmmaker and also, cause I, you know, I taught film production and producing on and off, uh, in, in LA and actually a bit here in China, um, between projects and, and we're talking about film festivals and, you know, what if someone strikes gold and they have all these agency offers, you know, after a big festival, and it's like, well, that's great. And it's flattering. And, and, and certainly agencies do can do some wonderful things with you. But of course, you know, if it, you know, the big agencies snap up all the winners of the big festivals. And then if they don't strike again, pretty soon they're, you know, backlisted to use your term <laughs> or, you know, they're, they're put, they're put away in the filing cabinet while the more prominent clients get the, uh, get the attention. So, so it's, it's, I think the same thing would obviously apply. It works in the record business. You know, if you don't really light the world on fire, then, uh, you kind of have a quick moment if you're one of, the, one of these majors, but the fact that you could do this, um, like bespoke boutique approach let you be really personal. I want to, I want to back up a second. How did you become you? Let's, let's get to where you were an associate producer at an award show. Let's take a few minutes and you know, what were your, what was your kind of your origin story in LA? Like what were you thinking to do? And you know, how, how did your career evolve to the point that you were helping produce an award show? Like a lot of young people, you know, you go come out of uh, USC business school with an idea that uh, with a marketing degree that you could work in the ad agency business. And so I I did that a bit for uh, for a time and did some other marketing for other financial companies. And I really wasn't kind of feeling it. You know, the whole corporate environment and selling products. Yeah be it motorcycles or be it uh, financial products or something, it was a little flat, you know, to be, <laughs> yeah. to be perfectly candid. Yeah. It was a little, you know, it's like, as Michael called, it's like it's like the machine, you know, are you going to be part of a machine or are you sure. going to be part of something that, that, that kind of connects with you? Mm-hmm. So the, the volunteer thing kind of came out of this, probably this uh, internal need to kind of express myself Mm -hmm. At one point, I was with a financial organization, and uh, for some reason, like some of the video people uh, were ill or they dropped out, and I said, "I'll do it." You know, I can can do this. And so I just basically executive produced a whole series of uh, of videos that were very successful within the company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I remember to this day the person uh, in the video department says, "You know." You know, I know you're, you know, in that department, but you really f- probably belong in our department. <laughs> and I said, nice. I said, yeah, I, I would probably agree with that. You know, I think there's something, something there. And then the early days of Michael Weesey Productions was so um, uh, eclectic that every, not only every week, but every day, you know, it'd be something, something new to present or mm-hmm. something new to, to, to show up to, whether it, be um, going to Republic Home Video or going to uh, BEA or going to, yeah, I don't know if you remember VSDA, the old uh, video show. 
Oh, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I never attended <laughs> or anything, but I remember it vaguely. I, I was in film school in the su- super early 90s, so I was aware of these things, you know, after the fact from being published. And, uh, you know, I, I get a copy of the trades in Atlanta and, you know, there'd be the recap of things like that that had happened. But I wasn't in L.A., so I uh, I missed a lot of these events in the, in the early days, but I, I recognize that. And then because of Michael's eclectic background and so forth, I just sort of uh, – it was uh, an amazing opportunity to work with someone who uh, had so many varied interests. And so I mm-hmm. never, you know, early on, I knew it wasn't a good idea to blink and say, yeah. I don't understand that category uh, and I have no interest. It's better just to say, I don't understand that category. I will find a way to find interest. Because, right. Uh, you just basically have to kind of keep up with the rocket ship, you know. Sure. I remember at one point, you know, uh, really early on, um, you know, because it's, it was literally two guys in a garage kind of thing. Um, uh, he asked me, well, um, uh, my daughter, I want to do something special for her. I go, Oh, okay. <laughs> and he said, I want you to produce a Balinese shadow play for her. <laughs> and, uh, wow. I, I understood, uh, immediately what he wanted because of his, you know, personal interest in the in the, the stories that he would mm-hmm. tell me about mm-hmm. his his love of Bali, and you know, sure enough, we just hire the <laughs> get the uh, the right kind of uh, configuration of items, uh, have his friends come in, uh, light it appropriately, yeah, yeah. and uh, away you go. There was a Balinese shadow play in his in his backyard. It was just wow. kind of like. And people used to always ask me, like, you know, what are you doing this week? <laughs> it was, it was, it was hard to kind of, you know. I suppose if you have a linear job like you're a chiropractor or mm-hmm. a, you know engineer, yeah. you could probably describe something. But when you say, you know, well, <laughs> I'm working on a book. Oh no, we're, you know, we're we're flying over here because uh, you know a consulting project has interest in. Uh, you know, uh, uh, diet for a new America, mm-hmm, or, uh, mm-hmm. we are, uh, you know, talking to, um, Michael Nesmith of, uh, yeah, the monkeys. Uh, about a project. Yeah. You know, it's like, wow. really, you know, and, you know, and over the years, like really eclectic stuff, sure. uh, ranging from in infomercials to uh, a PBS series mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, of course, of course the books and the eventually, which led to, uh, 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 increased uh, interest in foreign rights. So right, uh, right. Yeah, that's the nice thing about working you know, with uh, closely with an individual. You know, we shared so much time together uh, uh, over many lunches and so forth that we you know, we we began to like think really quickly and mm-hmm. have almost like a short shorthand right. knowledge uh, of each other to the extent that by the time. Back in the old days, when we were getting faxes, <laughs> right, from, I remember from, Ger- from Germany and saying, you know, you know, we have interest in your in your titles. Meet us in Frankfurt. And I go, Frankfurt. What are they talking about? <laughs> and then they then the whole world opened up, and you know, I, I realized very quickly they meant the Frankfurt Book Fair. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I talked to Michael, and I said, hey, Michael, we're getting so many faxes. You might as well explore this further, mm-hmm. and. Uh, he said, uh, okay, you know, figure it out. That was his famous, uh, famous, yeah. line, figure it out. Yeah. And, uh, so I started going in Frankfurt and now our books are in 21 different languages wow. around the world. I'm really proud that the books are, are, you know, making a real difference in, in France and Germany and in China and Japan and Korea. Mm-hmm. And that I have personal and professional relationships with it, with these people. And I get to, share the work of a Chris Vogler of the writer's journey. I get to share the work of uh, Judith Weston on, on directing actors. It just, uh, uh, you yeah. know, the U S still has a very fine reputation for filmmakers and filmmakers and storytellers. And we, we are, you know, we are in that sweet spot where, um, people readily acknowledge like, uh, uh, because of the titles and the success of, Save the Cat and and uh, the other aforementioned titles that uh, 
we've done well and we're sure. not we're not we're not penguin or random house there's no there's no layers it's just yeah Michael yeah and I. exactly <laughs> it's it's I, I i won't i won't ruin this by putting it out on air but uh but you're you're relatively easy to find actually as is michael and um yeah it's a pretty uh pretty direct point of contact i think if you guys are to your credit, you also give very good no because I think I gave you a proposal once upon a time, and it was. I was like, "Have you have you heard of our book about?" I was like, "Oh no, okay, that sounds like my idea, but better." <laughs> so, um, well, for the sake of people listening, um, I've been. I've kind of joked that I, I guess I'm the unofficial unofficial podcaster for you guys in a way. I mean, obviously I'm doing my own independent show, but I've been really happy to feature live your authors and of course, Michael himself and now you. So we're kind of closing the circle on the origins of this for the sake of people who are just kind of tuning in or missed other episodes among the authors I've had, uh, had some of your newer, newer authors had Greg Lofton had Waco Lynn, who's kind of seems to be setting the world on fire with his new screenwriting book. But yes, I, but in terms of your classic, you know, we had Chris Vogler on for one of my favorite conversations ever. Um, he who, of course, wrote the writer's journey you're talking about. And Chris and I are, you know, we're, we're chatting back and forth and we're going to do a round two when he comes up for air and have this whole other conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, working the schedule with Judith Weston. So we'll have her on the show pretty soon. And, of course, I had Stephen Katz on who wrote, as I talked about in that interview with him, his book, Directing Actors, became a textbook for me when it came out, like like, like 91, Shot by Shot. Yeah, sorry, I'm crossing streams. Shot by Shot became this textbook for, you know, in my, when I was in film school. And so my entire, I mean, I've been in this a long time myself, you know, close to 30 years. But nonetheless, those those books are are those are part of the reference library for me. Something that's more recent, and we're gonna we're gonna get into this in some detail, of course, is Save the Cat with Blake Snyder, who left a bit too soon for some health health issues, but unfortunately. But I want to talk about how you met Blake and the legacy of the the Save the Cat world because that's really redefined the way that people talk about screenwriting. Um, what were the first? Let me ask you this because in the early days. As you said, it was very eclectic, and you're doing all these productions and consulting, and also books. And was it was it the interest in Chris Vogler's book from the German publisher? Was was that what really helped to sort of put a focus on publishing, or am I trying to pigeonhole it too much? When when did the publishing become such a primary focus? Because of course, it seems like that's the you know between. Between MWP and and then the Divine Arts label, which is a bit more into esoteric subjects, when, when did the publishing really become the the front burner of the, uh, of oh, the operation? Yeah. Well, uh, just circling back to my previous point, uh, I remember it was 1998 because that was the about the time when the New York publisher kind of. Uh, Oh, did. Tip their hat, so to speak, yeah, and yeah. said, you know, you're kind of, you're sitting on a sleeping giant. If you did it properly, this would mm-hmm. really go well. So we, uh, we we did some due diligence, did some homework, and we switched distributors to National Book Network, which at the time was a pretty prominent uh, uh, distributor. Kind of uh, the interesting thing about the publishing business is that as soon as you express interest or people are aware of who you are uh, a lot of the data is online so they uh they, they looked up our titles and they said hmm shot by shot mm-hmm, you know it's mm-hmm. doing a good volume hmm writers during hmm huh even you know even directing actors at the time so what the feedback came back was is that uh, you know vertical niche oriented publishers who are very uh, good at what they do, uh, but what they warned us, and uh, and we, I remember this to this day, we were introduced to a sort of a legendary marketing uh, genius in the publishing world, the, the late Miriam Bass, and uh, they welcomed us to the conference. Um, it was a lot more formal, mm-hmm. well, much more formal than what we were used to, because in the old days, again, <laughs> I, rem- I was as I alluded to, it was like, Oh, we ran out of books. I guess we better print some more. This right. is more like you, sh- you show up at sales conference. You be prepared. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You hit your deadlines. Do not miss your deadlines. Right. Otherwise, you know, the whole 
chain of distribution is going to go south. So, you know, she is largely responsible for kind of putting a professional uh, timetable uh, and thought process into thinking about mm -hmm. uh, uh, positioning our titles. We kind of did everything that they suggested and we advanced back in those days, I think 20, 25,000 units right out the gate with the, with the, the new edition of the writer's journey. So we had, you know, early success and then we had more success mm -hmm. right off the, mm -hmm. right off the bat. And then as the company continued to evolve and change, we subsequently changed to Ingram publishing services and the same thing happened. They, they it was so, unusual <clears throat> when you're sort of like known by other people before that you you think they you're introduced to them properly mm -hmm. and uh <laughs> that's when the those are the days when they got when people were batting around the term i, I know you know this term the long tail right right because uh, that was around 2008 and again another really smart gentleman named phil olilla welcomed us to ingram pitched us really hard and said you know not only do we want to work with you because of this title, this title, this title, you're the number one publisher in your category, right. but you're also long tail. And then I asked him at the time, like, what, like, do you what does that mean? <laughs> well, I, it means that, uh, you know, you have plenty of business uh, and that, uh, you know, the, the last customer will always seek out your, your kind of title because where mm -hmm. else are they going to go? You right. know, you have no... Right meaningful competition in certain categories right and then he, he also shocked and surprised us because that's what people do in the publishing world he says by the way you can pitch uh barnes and noble and baker and taylor yourself you know we you don't really need us to do that so oh. subsequently we just kind of took on more responsibility not less responsibility and it's and it's and it served us well mm -hmm. Well, you had to learn everything. Um, I mean, have, having to find your way through the forest that way, it, it is interesting that you didn't set out to be, you know, in book publishing, for instance, but but that you really grew this together, and you know that that I am that has to be a, a core part of the success because you you evolved this uh, together, and and you working with Michael over these years. Um, of yeah, those, it was, it, yeah. it, it, it was also uh, 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 we. Uh, uh, we uh, recently did uh, two big events this this year, one in Minneapolis and another one in Los Yeah, the writers, uh, the writers' and, events. Talk uh, talk about those. <clears throat> so what was perfectly clear? Uh, uh, we hosted an event called the Future of Story Minneapolis uh, with at a Playwright Center, and uh, at, at one point, uh, kind of occurred to me, got on my radar, that the University of Minnesota has an imprint related to. Uh, you know, filmmaking titles. Mm -hmm. So I asked someone, well, maybe we should invite them. And the, and the feedback came back, Ken, these are publishers. They're not filmmakers. They're not mm -hmm. storytellers. Mm -hmm. They're publishers. They have no personal interest in the <laughs> kinds of things that you're talking about. Okay. And uh, it just reiterated, I think, what was happened because of Michael's relationship with these authors that, uh, they were friends. They were mentors. They, mm. He's a filmmaker. Everyone's interested in storytelling. They're interested in, in uh, conveying the importance of uh, creating media. And uh, it, it's not just about pushing a product out the door, as we mentioned before, because mm. you know, I find it impossible to think about selling something that is not intrinsically interesting sure or sure that i don't think contributes to the to the rest of the world but it's 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 easy to talk about these books because i see the look in the professor's eyes or our students eyes or mm -hmm. young people's eyes going way down to high school they see this sort of uh, ignition in their eyes it's really kind of exciting where they say i never thought of that yeah i never thought yeah. of you know writing about that i never thought of uh <laughs> being able to articulate a story in that manner and it, it just propels them in a way that is uh very gratifying so well what are some of the things let, let's talk a little bit about the recent endeavors because as i mentioned earlier i 
Um, I, I've had you know directing actors from Judith Weston, and she has the the, the follow up book to that as well that I've had copies for years, and their, her audio book is sitting here on my computer waiting for me to to dig into that this next week. And I also just recently listened to the the Save the Cat Goes to the Movies audio book, and of course that's not narrated by Blake Snyder for obvious reasons. Let's back up. Let's 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 set the stage a little bit about Save the Cat. And for the sake of someone who's not in film and TV specifically, this is a very entertainment skewing podcast, but um, kind, of, kind of set up who is Blake Snyder and what is Save the Cat, kind of in your words, and I'll maybe chime in here. Well, the, the benefit of having a long relationship with Michael Weesey Productions is that, you know, instead of uh, looking at notes or something, I just remember from my own life about meeting individuals in this case of all things blake snyder was first introduced to us by uh, by bj markle who was a copy editor for us and he says i have a friend who's interested in copy editing too so you know that was my job oh okay still is to this still, still is this today too is to assign copy editors to, to new manuscripts and so mm-hmm. forth so he, he finished uh, copy editing an older title and then he in his typical Blake way, says, oh, by the way, I, I'm interested in pitching a book, too. And he said, oh, <laughs> you know, it did, didn't really face me. He says, oh, sure, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. please do. And then he sends us the manuscript for Save the Cat. And for those in the entertainment industry, <laughs> Save the Cat is the, it's a three-word hook about a individual character, uh, uh, typically the lead hero in a story that has to do s- something noteworthy or humanistic early on the film so that the audience will engage and follow them along. Mm -hmm, So it could be, mm -hmm. for example, saving a cat out of a tree or other examples from many other movies like like Aladdin, where Aladdin is a scruffy street urchin. But guess what? He steals. That's not good. But guess what? He gives the food to uh, people less fortunate than, right, fortunate right. than him. So then he be, he becomes your eyes and your heart <laughs> and your mind says, he's the one I want to follow. So that, uh, amazingly enough, was in 2005 when Save the Cat uh, came out. And uh, uh, the stories, again, from uh, the writer's store and even our printer, our printer called me and said, Ken, Someone sent us the wrong file. There's some kind of cat on one of your books. And he says, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> did you did you read the subtitle, the last book on screenwriting you'll ever need? And they go, oh, I didn't even notice that. You sure you want this? I mean, they we were kind of like so incredulous. That's it. So yeah, we're we're going for it. You know, we we, we think it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Same thing at the uh, the writer store uh, from uh, Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, cl- classic you know, that- classic uh, for people who don't know writer stores, the legendary bookstore all about writing. You know, play plays and film and TV and and kind of one of the one of the great bookstores in uh in of <laughs> in the U.S. and probably have, in the world, frankly. Yeah, they have subsequently closed, unfortunately. Unfortunately, those right. Early go-go, go-go years, they they used to call me and said, you know, people are literally stopping in their tracks because they're looking at, uh, you know, a cover. It looks like, you know, a screen canister. They're looking at another cover. Oh, it looks like a you know laptop computer or a desktop. And then all of a sudden, this cat appears out of nowhere, and it makes them stop dead in their tracks. And, uh, you know, the... <laughs> One of the great of many gifts of Blake Snyder was his ability to uh, communicate his uh, his uh, structural elements related to his stories, but mm-hmm. also to create hooks right. so that it was impossible for you to forget his his messages and ideas in such a succinct way. And it was it was a hit then, and it's a hit now. And uh, subsequently, he came. That was Save the Cat goes to the movies in uh, in two thousand uh, and seven, mm-hmm. and then uh, more recently, uh, Dreamscape, a very high end independent uh, audio book company, started mm-hmm. approaching us about Save the Cat, and uh, the market had to shift and change over the years because um, prior to this, the word, at least at the street level, was that. Uh, you know, John Grisham 
can make a deal. Um, uh, yeah, like the major you know, publishers, uh, Ken Follett could do an audio book, or yeah, you know, like a hit begets a hit, but anything below, uh, you know, a big New York Times bestseller is not going to penetrate the market. But guess what? It turns out that the niche market, again, our market mm-hmm. for people interested in uh, storytelling, uh, they're 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 not only interested, but they're they want to hear. Uh, the work of uh, Blake Snyder in their car, in their computer, over and over again to mm-hmm. kind of like learn from from the master by osmosis. Right. And so that came out, and then I'm really pleased to announce that uh, new the new Save the Cat Goes to the Movies audio CD just came out uh, this year. So we're mm-hmm. we're kind of on this nice little roll. Uh, the wonderful thing about uh, uh, the success of uh, Save the Cat and, quite frankly, all of our books is that it hits in places where we don't expect it all the time. Um, we'd like to credit ourselves as being marketing geniuses. Well, I knew that was going to happen, but uh, you know, there's no way you can uh, obviously predict certain things. By way of example, I was at uh, South by Southwest in Austin, and uh, a guy was at our table and admiring them and he said you know i love this book he's pointing to uh save the cat i go oh great mm-hmm. are you a writer and he, he says no and he kind of blushed i said yeah. oh are you a screenwriter he goes oh he even blushed even more go oh no 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 and he says oh so why does this book mean so much to you and he said i write software manuals he says mm-hmm. do you have any idea how hard it is to make a software manual <laughs> inter- interesting sure sure and then I, I boy, it re reminded me about mm-hmm. the genius of Blake Blake Snyder that he had he had absorbed some of the ideas about the beat sheet and about structure and about you know maybe the death of a software engineer or something that he had <laughs> right. to make something in as dry as toast as as interesting as possible. And uh, of course, we made the sale. Same thing with the writer's journey too. Uh, as Chris Vogler has conveyed, mm-hmm. he is he is surprised and delighted as we are about the number of people who who see the book in ways that he couldn't possibly imagine before, in, mm-hmm. in terms of the travel agents or in terms of the prisoner community or in oh, okay. terms of people on parole and things of that sort. Interesting. People seem to find their way to the work and say, "This is this is my story. I want to articulate it. I want to convey it in the best way possible." Um, what's what I, really neat, and, and I think you'll, I think you'll find this with the uh, audio books, is that uh, you know I, I got teary eyed when I heard uh, um, George Newberry, a mm-hmm. really talented uh, voiceover artist, do uh, Save the Cat, and subsequently Save the Cat goes to the movies because he was handpicked because of his sense of humor and yeah. because of his lightness, and I, I know Blake would be smiling and just giggling with with delight about how well he articulated his work so many years later but it really is a different way of accessing information that you think you're familiar with totally if you're in your car or in your you know on a plane in your case or you're on a train and you have a a, some time i'm I'm telling you it's going to fire up your imagination it's sort of like reignite some uh some engines there in terms of writing or maybe helping you solve a particular problem or just uh, giving you a, like a nice little whack on the side of the head. It's just, it's exactly <laughs> I need that what myself as well. Well, that's, that's part of what was fun about, about getting into this for me was specifically because I'm in the process of, of, um, I, I have a, a, a TV pilot because I I really want to I really want to spend my my dotage in, in television. Um, I feel like that's where I'm going to be most effective, and and so I have something that I'm rewriting that I you know envisioned a certain mm-hmm. way five years ago. I tried to make an independent feature script. I'm like, eh, this is TV as hard as it is to do a TV show as a guy who's never done it. He's not never sold a TV show. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try. And I ended up pitching the new version of it. And I've had really, you know, frankly, I've had really encouraging response. And so I'm in the process of the early days of the rewrite to make the script match what I pitched. 
And so then this came along where you and I, you and I were, were, were emailing and you said, would you like to look at this Save the Cat Goes to the Movies audiobook? I'm like, yes, I would. <laughs> and it's been really great, you know, um, to, like you said, to kind of shake loose some, some ideas and to be able to find my way through it. And you, you said that Blake Snyder, he, he had, when he was, when he took the copy editing job, he already had manuscript for the first, for Save the Cat. He he basically had it ready to ready to pitch. You know, I, I'm not quite sure of the timing. I mean, uh, but his it was, personal friends with uh, B.J. Marco. It wouldn't surprise me, being kind of like the pro that he was, that uh-huh. he might have actually he might have actually said, you know, a soft entry would be to copy it at something uh-huh, so I right, could see the right. editorial <laughs> style. And then once I get a feel for mm. uh, how they work and how they operate, maybe. I can uh, share something else. I think, like a lot of our authors, it might have been based upon his, like his personal journal and his notes, sure, or lectures sure. or workshops, and it just kept in getting closer and closer. But now that I come to think of it, I, I imagine it's a little bit of both that he. He might have been more strategic the- about it from the beginning. He might have because he, he was he was yeah. a screenwriter and he 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 was a working guy. So uh, so that that's pretty clever. Yeah. That's pretty clever that he. But the- Pursue the copy we, editing uh, job in order to learn uh-huh. your learn your uh, to see to see how you make the donuts from the inside, basically. And then Blake, uh, we always hold up uh, uh, Blake as an example to our other authors about uh, how to uh, how to sell. You know, well, in his case, you know, hundreds of thousands of units. Mm-hmm. We kind of make a joke that Blake was the only one who ever took me so literally because, uh, you know, I say uh, quite a few of the same things to all the authors, but Blake would be so literal, you know, like one, one as a quick example, you know, Blake would always call excited about something and he'd say, well, you know, what can I do to market the book, uh, mm-hmm. Ken? And I go, oh, you know, uh, why don't you just, uh, you know, ever see the movie Amelie? Just uh, take photos of your book in unusual places, because that's kind of like a, you know, a little bit of a metaphor mm-hmm. that the book mm-hmm. is just appearing everywhere, right. and, and that uh, it, it has a life of its own. <laughs> like a week later, <laughs> he took you literally. Yeah. Unbeknownst to me, it, there's a photo of Blake on the Great Wall of China with Save the Cat. <laughs> <laughs> awesome! I mean, it's like, oh, I guess I guess you took took me literally. Wow! And another time. True story. He calls me. He goes, I, I sold a book, Ken. I go, well, that's great. You know, it, <laughs> with Blake, it's impossible to be kind of down and yeah. know, just like crush his little spirit. I say, you sold a book, you know, that's nice. He goes, but you don't understand. Uh, do you know the uh, the big car wash on Sunset Boulevard? I go, yeah. yeah. He goes, I sold books there and I convinced the, the car wash owner to carry my books in that car wash. He goes, you don't understand, Ken. <laughs> Every every Hollywood executive uses that car wash. And I said, right, right, right. Good, good, good job. Yeah, Mike. that's and that's then, clever. Uh, he just story after story. <laughs> a lot of it had to do with his, uh, you know, take your advice again and keeping his email in the book. Mm-hmm, but more mm-hmm. importantly, answering those thousands and thousands of individual emails that he used to get about I'm pitching this, I'm pitching mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. and uh, I think Blake. Uh, because of his personality and because he wanted to be supportive, answered every single email, yeah. every single email. That's amazing. To the extent that uh, there, there are Save the Cat groups forming all over the country to this day and to the extent that uh, their new chief uh, uh, marketing officer was uh, a student. It was just someone who kind of fell in love with the work, wanted to try screenwriting. Mm-hmm. Uh, had a prior background at uh, being a marketing executive for Microsoft and uh, for other big brands and said, you know, there's something really special about the Save the Cat brand. And uh, uh, he's taking it uh, to uh, further heights and in new ways that uh, we always laugh because it's like you know, nobody would have been able to predict uh, a title from 2005 uh, appearing on the front cover of New Yorker magazine or, or appearing on Stephen Colbert mm-hmm. or, uh, mm-hmm. or, uh, uh, or uh, you know, being uh, uh, quoted uh, and uh, both good and bad quotes coming from, you know, <laughs> uh, 
journalists and from um, cartoonists. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the other fun part where the, the book has been translated into you know, 10 different languages around the world as well. I think Waco Lin, author of Crazy Screenwriting Secrets, might have told you that uh, when he goes to China, he says every Chinese executive knows how to say save yeah. the cat in yeah. English. It's like, yeah. it's astonishing. It's Absolutely. Astonishing. And, and I saw, um, I, I forget who I mentioned it to. I might have mentioned it to you at some point, but um, I mean, several years ago before we were, before I was even podcasting, just, you know, going to bookstores here. And I don't, I mean, I speak, I speak enough Chinese to be, you know, dangerous basically, but I don't read and write it. And so of course going into some of these bookstores just by way of going to the cafe that's in the back or something um, and seeing the titles. And of course they will often having you know, English as well on the cover, even if the book is in Chinese. And I would see several of the books, including, you know, including shot by shot and, and uh, with very different artwork, but it says Stephen J. Katz and it says, uh, you know, film directing shot by shot in English as well as all the Chinese. And, I I know Stephen Katz, of course, has a long history with working with China. We talked about that in the interview. We have some common friends here that we discovered kind of along the way. But um, but it's really interesting that those have become references. And, and you know, they, they get it pretty universal truths related to storytelling. And and it leads me to sort of a, a, a slight gear shift, which is the other imprint, the Divine Arts imprint. Can you talk about what that – is for the sake of somebody who hasn't heard Michael's interview because we talk about that a lot, and then we'll I want to ask you sort of where that's going and and what you're what you're working on uh, with that imprint. Yeah, well, Divine Arts. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, very early on the interview that Michael is very eclectic in his interests, and I I, I knew that it uh, it would never be a dull moment in terms of trying to track, you know, his personal and professional interests. And so the imprint, uh, which uh, became more of a, a model related to mind, body, spirit books, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, something that him and his wife says that this is something that uh, we want to do and we think uh, we have something to share. And so very eclectic and interesting books on uh, ayahuasca came out mm -hmm. books on toad medicine came out and books on buck mr fuller came out and the the one that uh, seems to be resonating right now um uh, the most is the the book goodbye parkinson's hollow life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it i was just telling my friend today that uh, and uh, actually a family member today too that uh you know, in publishing, you you work in different um, eclectic groups of different people with different interests and, and so forth. And so uh, I found myself um, early on with the, the Parkinson's project because of Michael's uh, condition, kind mm -hmm. of immersed in the world of uh, the Parkinson's community. Uh, to the extent that I, I, I went to the World Parkinson's Conference in Portland, Oregon in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, I've befriended quite a, a few of them who have become personal friends. And uh, the really interesting thing is that uh, in October of this year, there's a World Parkinson's ping pong tournament in New York. Mm. And... Uh, and uh, my good friends from from Team Denmark are are coming, yeah, and competing <laughs> and cool. representing uh, everything and uh, uh, about the work of Alex Curtin and Goodbye Parkinson's Hello Life, which means you know, work hard, play hard, laugh hard, mm -hmm, force mm -hmm. yourself to yeah. do things that you think are are beyond your capability, and. Uh, that has become kind of like a, a cornerstone of the divine arts uh, imprint these days because, uh, again, because I'm in charge of foreign rights, I sold the rights to uh, Italy and to Spain. And, uh, uh, and there's a Hebrew edition now. Um, so we, we kind of like to say the same tagline that we've said with uh, Michael Weesey Productions, but in a different way. It's like, you know, we are touching the lives of the Parkinson's community one book at a time you know, mm. because the mm. books get out there. It sort of changes people's ideas and uh, relationship with their uh, 
to music and to singing mm -hmm. and to um, uh, to conducting with their hands, and uh, it's changed my life too to the extent that uh, you know you're just surrounded by people who are uh, very inspirational and who are very mm -hmm. honest and want, want to just share about their that they just you know I could give up I could roll over but I, I choose not to. And I just like, it never ceases to amaze me how, how uh, inspirational and how uh, an author, uh, in this case, Alex Curtin and, and his associate, David Brin and Michael, you know, made that courageous decision to come out with a, with a book that uh, was at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we hope that, uh, you know, the, 10 million people around the, the world with Parkinson's will, will find the book and hear about the book and it will make a difference in their life. So it's, uh, that's what I think about in that, that particular, mm -hmm. that particular imprint. And again, it is a perfect reflection of Michael's, uh, professional and personal interest to talk right. about, uh, filmmaking one day and then talk about, Buckminster Fuller the next day. Absolutely. So you, you just you just have <laughs> yeah. to you just have to roll. <laughs> that was the most that was the most fun part of our conversation and and from reading his book, uh um from reading onward and upward and and I made so many notes to prepare for that interview and and for some reason, and I've been a Bucky Fuller fan for, for decades now myself. And so for some reason we were in the conversation and I had not actually made a note about that previously. And he, and he mentioned him in passing and I'm like, Oh, right. And then we did about 15 minutes on Bucky Fuller. Right. And, and right. he has such a, Michael's story is just so amazing. I, I have to imagine that. I mean, I, I, I think I'm fairly envious of, of, of your job and your life in the sense of, of how, what it must have been like for you to, to read all these things and to meet all these people along the way, of course, and to absorb, you know, I mean, like your own evolution has to be kind of mind boggling if you just stop and look backwards, right? Oh, uh, Brendan, you know, <laughs> I was just thinking the other day, because we had an author summit in August in Los Angeles. So we, uh, I do what I do, I organize the event, plan the event, make it a, a fun, eclectic event for our authors to get together and to, to brainstorm and think about new opportunities and to thank them for their participation. And uh, uh, I forgot to tell the, the joke, but uh, subsequently I have told the joke to, to Michael and, and other authors, and they all agree that it is the, the, the winning joke of all time. It's like, it took me decades and decades but now i'm finally at the cool table you know it just <laughs> took nice. a little while and nice. so forth. because when you can um not only you can say that you've worked with chris vogler but yeah. then you can quote him and then you can remember all those dozens of conversations mm -hmm. you know everything mm -hmm. from uh, from him telling me years ago he says ken film noir is not supposed to make sense. Nobody knew what was going on. <laughs> Bogey didn't know what was going on. It's 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 more about a feeling than, yeah, than yeah. a resolution of something that makes sense. I said, oh, oh. I get it. Or or you know when Chris, um, who is a Facebook friend, I value his little uh, his remarks at one time because uh, I, this is kind of like a that perfect mix of divine arts and Michael Lisi Productions. There was a very uh, powerful uh, message on Facebook going around about, um, you know, uh, the obviously the one that uh, you've probably heard before, but the story that you tell yourself and the rest of the world uh, is a reflection about how you want to position yourself right. and how you want to present yourself to the world. And, and of course, Jen Crisani, who wrote an excellent book for us uh, on that same topic, uh, she chimed in and says, this is terrific. And then Chris Vogler, in his own succinct way, he says, yes, indeed, you are the script supervisor of your own life. Ah, and I said, oh, nice. and I said Chris, I'm going to steal that one, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, very, like, that's, that's very quotable. <laughs> I know. I said, that's, that's too good to let go. And it's just like, yeah, you are the script supervisor of your life. So, 
you know, one of the things that we're, I was so proud of at this particular event at this summit was that uh, uh, because we have no staff to speak of, yeah, you know, it's a case of, uh, of uh, you know, kind of like the, the Mickey Rudy and uh, Judy Garland model. Like, <laughs> Come on, let's gonna, put on a show. We're going to. We're going to have this event, but guess what? You have to help me set up the, you know, set up the room and yeah. you know, the caterer is going to come and I can't do it by myself. And sure enough, you know, authors came sweating like I was. To yeah. Get those tables and chairs set up, get the caterer set up, get the microphone set up. And, mm-hmm. you know, instead of, instead of me talking to them or them talking to me, it's like, we're all in this together, mm-hmm. you know, schlepping, schlepping books. I mean, I often make jokes about that, about, uh, a uh, Michael Weesey author has to be uh, uh, help filmmakers solve a problem. Mm-hmm. They have to talk endlessly or want to talk endlessly to groups of one, five, fifty, or five hundred because it's just it's just mm-hmm. bubbling up out of them. Right. They have to have some kind of platform to convey that to people. And are they kind of people that I want to hang out with? Are they going to will? Are they going to help me? You know, lift. <laughs> help you set up banquet books? tables. <laughs> At the, at the next conference, because yeah. that's kind of yeah. part of the gig, you know. Sure. Like we, we, uh, to be, uh, uh, we sh- I showed a photo of one of our last summits to a Chinese publisher. He smiled and said, "Oh, what what a nice looking staff as employees." <laughs> and I said, "Mr. Those are the Mr. authors. Wu, these are the authors. They're my friends." And the wow. look on his face was like. Oh, I mean, I, I don't think he—I don't think he even registered with them until yeah. I said, "These are our authors, and these are my friends." And yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, I'm, it's not an easy thing to 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 uh, to uh, to accomplish. And the other publishers, who I who I won't name, but we see them at other conferences, and we're laughing, and we're you know mm-hmm. we're working hard, and we're you know planning events both uh, private and, and public and so forth and they're just kind of there with their little order form sort of <laughs> sort of aloof and they might have had a they might have had oh, help to like yeah. put the tables together and all that yeah it, it's like a, a, a world of difference and uh, it, it, you know i think uh, you know coming full circle brendan when you said you know how does all this come together yeah. it's, it's it's a strange kind of synthesis of uh of, uh, of also um, liking to plan parties and events, really, because mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, I and, that, and I really never thought it was that hard because it, it came so naturally to me. It just had to be scaled up bigger and bigger as the years mm-hmm. <laughs> right, gone by. Right, right. But uh, I, you know, if you meet anyone in other businesses, when it comes to like putting on an event and selecting the event and securing you know caterers and making sure people show up and help and then people are happy and so forth uh, i i really realize that a lot of people just either they really don't like people or they just really don't know how to do it because <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. after a while it's certain events like okay i'm gonna take over because obviously <laughs> you know your group who said you could do this can't do this so we'll mm-hmm. just we'll just kind of step in and just help yeah. you out a little bit here so <laughs> nice well this this begs that as we were as we sort of are on approach to land the plane here i don't want to keep you up too late i know it's you're on seattle time and i'm on on, Be- on beijing time um do you have a book in you it sounds like you might do you do you have the impulse to uh you know, is there something that you want to commit to the page for posterity, or are you are you are your impulses in that direction satisfied by the work you do? You know, it, there are opportunities with both imprints to kind of express things, but I'm finding that it what has come about is that uh, that uh, there's some really interesting opportunities. Um, um, both domestically and uh, internationally, where uh, this eclectic background and uh, ability to kind of organize events is going to—it's all going to come together in a, in a meaningful way. So I'm, I'm kind of concentrating on that for right now. Sure. Just the idea of uh, of planning both uh, medium and large size events, both in the United States and and overseas, and just kind of spreading the word of yeah 
uh, both Michael Lisi Productions and Divine Arts in a in a in a meaningful way. That seems to be kind of uh, my my particular uh, 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 strength right sure, now, sure. and and also and also finding some really interesting partners who will just call each other once a week and talk about what's going on with uh, their particular niche of the world and what's going on with our niche, and all of a sudden, you know, it's like. Nikki Rooney and Judy Garland. We we got an event. We got a thing. We, got, we, <laughs> nice. have, we have something to plan and, and look forward to, and it all sort of makes sense. Yeah. It all uh, is is a win win. Nobody gets uh, slighted in the process. I think that's that's been particularly gratifying over the past few years. Is like you always find a way to like make make it work. Just just make it work. It's kind of like the other interesting thing about working with such a small organization is that we can obviously move quickly Mm -hmm. and uh, there are no layers of decision making (laughs) in terms of like what committee it's like uh, one email to michael and it's usually like go you know go or no movie figures go or no go yeah and it's 90 percent go you know uh, and uh and uh we're just like propelled in that direction. So we, we think there's going to be some really big things happening for us, uh, both, uh, uh, on the international front, uh, in, in particular, that's gonna get us, uh, you know, recognized as the, uh, you know, the, uh, the preeminent publisher for, uh, books about filmmaking and storytelling and, um, TV production and media, um, which the world really needs now. I mean, mm-hmm. the, probably don't need more widgets but you do need more uh, storytellers out there absolutely well what is uh what's the best question i didn't think to ask you or didn't know to ask you or if you have any uh or if you have any last thoughts you just want to want to get in there you know i i was thinking back how i thought i had met you and it was because of uh carl king uh, carl yeah carl king yeah. yeah and uh i think what i what came about uh, both at uh, because of my conversation with Carl and at the recent author summit was that uh, uh, that networking comes in all different shapes and forms. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you can be a uh, an extrovert and kind of actively seek things like that, and sometimes you can be more quiet and subdued, kind of like Carl King. Mm-hmm. He's a mm-hmm. quiet young man, really smart. Sure, and, but he was he was just very elegant because. Hmm. I see that title. <laughs> you want to reconnect with Brendan Davis. So I just wanted to nice. thank him and give a nod to him again that uh, we, we we reconnected in that in that way. Absolutely. Uh, and that you know, w- next time you're in Seattle, or if you ever go to the London Book Fair, or if you ever go to some other event that I see on Facebook, then we'll definitely yeah. Uh, Go have a beer or a cup of tea or whatever your pleasure is. That sounds awesome. And Carl is among his many other talents is a a extraordinary composer, and he did the theme music uh, to this show. If anyone's curious, yeah. and so yeah, so you'll get to hear Carl's work when I wrap it up in a few minutes. Ken, thank you so much for your time, man. And uh, I know I'll see you on the internet and the emails. But um, if anybody wants to find out more about what you're up to, I'm assuming you were to suggest them to check out the MWP and Divine Arts websites. Yeah, that would be the best way. Or, you know, uh, as a tip of the hat to uh, Blake Snyder, they can also email me uh-huh. at kenlee at mwp.com. Because, nice. Uh, um, um, <clears throat> our last summit, we, we readily acknowledged that uh, we wouldn't be where we were without uh, the authors uh, not only uh, doing what they do best, which is obviously doing their workshops and conveying their passion about helping other people become better directors or writers or producers or sound effects people, but they're, they're also their ability to introduce us like Carl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, Absolutely. To, to, to folks like you, that yeah. networking thing seems to be kind of a lost art where people get a little lazy and say, oh, I thought I emailed you once, and but sometimes once is not enough. So this is I, true. If someone wants to meet me or wants to, if you want to introduce me to people or vice versa, please, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to hesitate at all, Brendan, nice. to, uh, 
pick up that phone or that email or get an email and say, oh, I always wanted to meet Jack Ma. Thanks a lot, Brendan. That's a terrific <laughs> intro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hint, hint, hint received. Well, he's, yeah, we, yeah we, we might set your sights on somebody who's staying more in the game. <laughs> he's, okay. I think I think he's going to yeah. shuffle off and, yeah, I think he's going to shuffle off and make his, uh, probably make a pop album or something next. He's in a new phase. <laughs> Well, Ken, yeah. thank you. Yeah, he's he's uh he's an interesting character from what I understand, but have not had the opportunity to cross paths with him. But uh um Ken, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. And I will continue to, you know, I look forward to having more of the authors on as as uh schedules allow. But uh I really get it appreciate getting to know you a little bit more today. Thanks, Brendan. I really appreciate your time. Okay, that's the show this week. Don't forget to visit crazyinagoodway.com to learn more about Ken Lee, to find the links we discussed and his email address if you want to contact him. And you can also learn about the other shows that I do or reach out and contact me via the contact form. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next week.